Today we're going to talk about logic laws because sometimes doing truth table proofs between two sentences can take a very, very long time and we want to be able to find equivalences without taking a look at truth tables that can be up to 256 lines long. In fact, every truth table line can get increasingly bigger and bigger and bigger just by adding one statement. You double the amount of lines you need. So you can see if we have 20 lines or 20 statements, you're going to need 2 to the 20 lines, which is well over a million lines. And that's crazy. So we need these laws to make things a little bit easier. We're going to introduce some new statements, T and F. Now T is going to be something we've already seen, except I labeled it as a 1, and it's always going to be a 1. And we're going to say this is T. We also write the symbol like this with a longer stem in logic. And we have an F that is always going to output a 0. And in logic, we do this and we call this bot or the falsum. But I will use T's and F's for these videos because in most textbooks, they use T's and F's in discrete math. Anyways. I'm not going to do any proof by truth tables here. However, you can prove all of these in truth tables. So if you're unsure of whether I'm telling you the truth or not, then please go prove them yourself in a truth table. We're going to start off with some easy ones that use the false and truth functions. And we'll start with the identity laws. If we have P or false, it's the same thing as P since it's always going to be false, so the whole statement's only going to be true when p is true. And if we have p and true, it is also going to be equivalent to p, because if p is false in this scenario, then it's going to be false for the whole statement, therefore the whole thing's true only when p is true. And for domination laws, if we have p and false, well, every line is false, because false is every line, so this is the same thing as F, and if we have P or true, at least one of them has to be true, and true is always true, therefore the whole thing is true. And these are called domination laws, because the letters dominate the statements, and these are identity laws, because, well, you get the same result. It's an identical statement. Alright, so let's prove that P or false and Q or true is equivalent to being true. So we do bracket by bracket. Okay, we know P or false is equal to P. So we say this is P and Q or true, and we write identity. We want to clarify our steps every single time we do something. So this was the first step right here, simplifying P or false. In our second step, we're going to do Q or true. So this will be P and, well, Q or true is the same thing as truth, and this is domination. And now we have P and true. So P and true we need to do now, and we know this is equal to P, and this is identity. So here's a bit of a problem. I said, prove that this is equivalent to truth, but it's not. So we've actually proven that it's not equivalent. And I'm putting this right out as the first question, because sometimes when you get an exam, your prof will trick you, or maybe they didn't do the question themselves and have this issue. I still remember on my exam, I was given a question that could not be proven, even though it looked like it should have been proven, and the prof said, no, it's provable. Upon further review and looking at a couple of our answers, he realized that even though only 4 out of 150 people got it right, it couldn't be proven. So, this can happen. Don't always trust the question. Alright, some more laws here. We have double negation, which means that if we have not not p, it is equal to p. This should be intuitive. If p is true, then not p is zero, so not not p should be true. 
fairly straightforward. And De Morgan's laws are something you've seen before, where what you do is you distribute the negation in front of each statement, and then you reverse the operation. So instead of an and, you have an or. So not P and Q is the same thing as saying not P or not Q, and not P or Q is the same thing as saying not P and not Q, because we distributed the negation and we reversed the sign. So let's do a proof here. Not, not P and not Q is equivalent to P or Q. Well, first of all, when we have a negation bracket and a bunch of stuff in it, you should do De Morgan's first. So let's do that. So we're going to have not, not P or, because remember we change the operator here. And then we have not, not Q because we distribute the not. And this was by De Morgan's, which we just write dim. Now, with double negation, we just get rid of our negations here, and we write dn for double negation, and there you have p or q. If you were being rigorous, you would probably do one step at a time, but double negations are very easy to track and take care of, so doing them all in one line, probably not a big deal. We have some distributive laws and some absorption laws here. These are a tad bit trickier, but you should be okay with this. So this works very similar to multiplication and addition. I'll give you the law first, and then I'll make the comparison. So P and Q or R is the same thing as saying P and Q or P and R. And P or Q and R is the same thing as saying P or Q and P or R. Now the comparison is if we have 4 times a plus b, we get 4a plus 4b, which means we take this value in the second, or the 4 and the first value, and then we put an operation between them. Take this operation, we stick it there, and then we do 4 and the second value in the bracket. So this is the same thing. Here, we took PQ, and we shoved this in between them, and then we put the OR there, and then we took PR. So this is the same sort of thing. And if you remember, what I said before is sometimes P and Q is abbreviated just to PQ, then if we write PQ or R, we can see this is very very almost directly similar to PQ or PR, and it is a little bit more obvious about how this is related. So this is a nice little way of explaining distribution. And I should say that these names of these laws are something that you see in math all the time, so please pay attention to the names too, since it really helps your understanding if you can remember and say, oh yes, this property is distributive then you don't have to think about, oh, what does it do? Because you know, oh, it's distributive, you know what it does. You don't have to remember what things are, you just remember the name, and then the property comes with it. Absorption laws are cool. Basically, if you have P and P or Q, it's just P, that's a terrible P. And if you have P or P and Q, it just absorbs it to P. Pretty simple stuff. So let's simplify this. Not not p or p or false and not not q. First of all, let's do our double negations because double negations are a pain. So we're going to do this all at once. So we'll write dn. Now, let's solve that p or false. Well, p or false is the same thing as just saying p, and this is an identity. Now, let's say P or P and Q. Well, we know this is P because this is the absorption law. So we have simplified this seemingly complex statement into just one statement. This whole formula is exactly the same 
as P. Why deal with not not P or P or false and not not Q when you can just deal with P? This makes programming so much simpler. This makes logic gates so much simpler. This is a very, very powerful tool when trying to maximize your efficiency and understanding of how to write conditions in programming and anything you're going to be doing with applications of logic. Some more laws here. I call these trivial laws because these are things in logic we take for granted. There are some systems where these laws are not trivial and these laws do not hold. But for most of the things in first and second year math courses, these are straightforward and obvious. So commutativity means that you can reorder terms. So if you have P and Q, you have Q and P. I should mention this also works for P or Q. You just get Q or P. Pretty straightforward. Associativity means that we can move brackets around. So we can have P and Q and R with P and Q in brackets instead of Q and R in brackets. Similarly, if we have P or Q or R, this is the same thing as saying P or Q or R. Again, we can just move brackets around. Really not that impressive. And we have inverse laws. In fact, we've proven one of these inverse laws that P or not P is always going to be true, and P and not P is always going to be false. Of course, this is obvious, since, you, since if you have P and not P, you have a contradiction, since you're saying, oh yeah, it's raining and it's not raining. Well, thank you, in our world where we don't have multi-dimensions and crazy stuff happening, and there's no wormhole that opens to another dimension sitting over our house where it's both simultaneously raining and not raining, but... I mean, if that did happen, then we'd have to reevaluate this. However, the chances of that happening, I mean, if it is happening, please, like, let me know in the comments if it's raining and not raining at your house right now, because that's, uh, that's something that probably needs to be evaluated by people a lot smarter than me. But, I mean, I'd like to know first so I can get my name on it. Anyways, besides the point, those are inverse laws. So let's do some practice. Show that not p and q and q is equivalent to not p and q take a minute to do this and i will be back in a second all right so the tricky part is is this and i could have written this as not p and q comma q and proves not p and q this is the symbol for proves Sometimes they also have a therefore sign. Doesn't really matter. Anyways, what this really means is we have not P and Q, and this and translates directly as, a, as an and. Really not that difficult. So this is our premise. We don't have to write a line down for this, but it's good to write premise down so you know where it came from. Also, your assumption, if you want to write assumption instead. I know some people really like writing. Uh, it gives them great pleasure to start out a assignment with writing ass on a piece of paper. If you like it, go right ahead. It's an assumption. And for our first one, let's do De Morgan's Law. So we're going to get not P or not Q and Q. So this is De Morgan's. Now, there are a couple things that we could do here. We can either use the distributive property, or we can use not the associative property. So we have to distribute. Because these are different. Otherwise, I was going to say we could just use the associativity property and figure something out. But no, we have to distribute with different operators here. Okay. So in this case, we're going to get not P and Q or not Q and Q. And this is distributivity. Now what we can do is we know not Q and Q is always going to be false. 
due to our lovely inverse laws. And now, not P and Q or false is going to be the same thing as not P and Q. And this is due to our identity law. So this is a full proof of something. Uh, I think this makes sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a good way to bring in a bunch of rules together. I know there's a lot of rules going down today, and you might have to watch this video more than once. I'm just underlining all the steps I did in each line. But these laws, knowing them, knowing why they work, knowing how they work, are very important to simplifying things, as I expressed earlier with logic gates, programming, and you're going to want to know these. It's going to save you time. It's going to save you frustration. It's going to get you that A when you take your exam. And I know some profs will let you bring in a sheet with these rules on them in exams. But knowing things like what associativity is. In fact, I'm going to circle some really important words you should know. You should know associativity. You should know commutativity. You should definitely know what distributive laws are. Uh, De Morgan's is incredibly important for statistics and probability. Domination, not so much. Identity, uh, you don't really need to know identity. But those laws, De Morgan's, distributive, associative, and commutative, are used to describe a lot of different systems. For instance, matrix, matrix multiplication. You might not know what a matrix is, but you will learn in due time what a matrix is. And I will say that it is not commutative. And if I tell you not commutative, and you remember that matrix multiplication is not commutative, you will probably get 5 or 10% on an exam just by knowing the word commutative and that it's not commutative when you get a question that states, are these the same thing? You don't need to remember what's physically going on as a visual representation because you know what commutativity means. So knowing the names of these laws and what they do are going to save you in later mathematics, so please learn them now. That was all for logic laws. If you have a proof that you cannot do in your homework, on an exam, you want more review for these proofs, leave them in the comments. I might make a separate video on them because I do think that these kind of proofs are good. However, I don't have a lot of good example proofs right now, and a lot of them I already did in the Natural Deductive Logic series, so... You can check them there too if you're not sure. The system's a little bit different, but I'm sure if you're taking discrete math, you're smart enough to abstract them and understand what I'm doing in that series. But if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I will answer them as quickly as I possibly can.